this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 p.m. Local Time in the Central Time Zone, we have the undefeated, ranked number one, 10-0, 7-0 in Big Ten play, Oregon Ducks, traveling from Eugene, Oregon to Madison, Wisconsin, to take on the 5-4, 3-3 in Big Ten play, Wisconsin Badgers in the historic Camp Randall Stadium. This game will be streamed on NBC again at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 p.m. Local Time in the Central Time Zone where this game is taking place. Oregon opened up as a 14-point favorite. The line has increased by a point to Oregon, minus 14.5. And And the Ducks are given a 75.6% chance to win this game, according to ESPN's FPI. The game time weather is predicted to be about 48 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is a night game several time zones away, and that's what makes this game fascinating. It's going to be cold. The weather, I mean, who knows? Midwest weather, take it from me who lives in Michigan, can be totally different day to day, hour to hour, morning to night, morning to afternoon, afternoon to night, etc. It's unpredictable. So Oregon will be facing multiple points of adversity, and they will be traveling to a Wisconsin team who I think, under Luke Fickle and also his coordinators Phil Longo and Mike Tressel, are well coached, and they're coming off of a bye. So I suspect that Wisconsin is going to be throwing everything they have against Oregon in this matchup. The Ducks, meanwhile, are ranked number one. In all of the polls, unanimously, by the way, in the AP and Coaches Poll, I think they're the nation's best team. My power ratings think they are the best team. They're going to be put to the test against this Wisconsin team as their quest, obviously, for the Big Ten championship game. And, of course, the national championship, they're not finalized. But before I give you my preview and prediction for this game, I ask you to do a few things to help yourselves out and also to help this channel out. If you could please hit the like button, please hit the subscribe button as well, and click that notification bell so that you can get notified when we release new college football content here on College Football with Sam. We are the best Big Ten football channel on YouTube, and thanks to you pointing at you, we will become the best college football channel on YouTube. So give us a like if you can, please, to give us a boost in the algorithm, and also hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell. Other ways you can help us out are sharing this video and channel around to other college football fanatics, making sure that you return to the channel to watch us and all of our preview and prediction videos or as much as you reasonably can. I know that we're all busy. Comment your preview and prediction, some thoughts that you have, your score prediction, and we can engage in the comments together. And also join our Discord server via the link in the description or down below in the pinned comment. On the Discord server, you will get notified whenever we release a new video here on College Football with Sam. And also, there are several football fanatics in there waiting for more like you to join where we talk college football 24-7. And if you want to support the channel monetarily, donate some money to support what we do on here. No pressure, because all the things that you can do for free, we appreciate. But if you want to do that, there's Super Chats available in the comment section below, or you can sign up as a paid member on my Patreon page or also purchase merchandise on my merchandise store. And the links to those are in the description and down below in the pinned comment. That's also where the Discord server link is, in the video description or down below in the pinned comment, along with the Patreon page and merchandise store. We got all those things checked and out of the way. Thank you very much for tuning in. Let's dive in. So these teams from a broad angle are clearly not the same caliber. Wisconsin is a team who's been improving ever since the early part of the season. And I think they're well coached. I think that Luke Fickle and Matt Rule, for example, are two coaches who are in very similar predicaments. I think Fickle, based off of his track record at Cincinnati and also him being a defensive coordinator at Ohio State, I view him in a higher tier than Rule. But they're overall pretty close. And I am leaning toward them having success or at least more success than their predecessors at their respective schools. But they are encountering a lot of issues that their predecessors left behind. I don't think Christ left behind the best recruiting network, the best program, the best, the best culture, the best expectations, any of that stuff. I think Christ actually left the cupboard in a worse position. He left the house in worse shape, the foundation 
a little shakier than a lot of people would like to admit. And we don't even have to talk about that in regards to what rule is inherited at Nebraska. I mean, Scott Frost and then his predecessor, Mike Riley, just yikes, like make a vomiting noise or pull up any type of noise or sound that absolutely grosses you out. And well, that describes Nebraska football really over the past decade, nearly. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is Wisconsin, I think, is trending up. I think they're well coached, but they're clearly not who Oregon is. Oregon is also well coached, but on top of that, they have more blue chip players. They have more NFL players. They've developed better thus far. They scheme better. They are superior in multiple aspects of the game compared to Wisconsin, and that bears out here when you look at the power ratings. Oregon per FPI is just 21.4 points better than the average college football team. Per S&P Plus, they are viewed as 27.4 points better than the average college football team. And per my potential power ratings, Oregon is viewed as 27.2 points better than the average college football team. You compare this to Wisconsin, the Badgers are viewed as only 7.3 points better than the average college football team in FPI. 5.9 points better than the average CFB team per S&P Plus. And 5.6 better than the average CFB team per for my PPI, the Potential Power Index. You factor in home field advantage here. Wisconsin, I'd say, I mean, Camp Randall, I imagine it with it being a night game is going to be full. Sometimes it's not full during noon, but then again, it's rare for a stadium to be full at noon, especially the student section. Give Wisconsin, I'd say, three points, maybe four at the most in home field advantage. If you want to give them an extra point or so because, well, Oregon's traveling across the country. It's not like they're traveling to Rutgers or Ohio State, but they're they're still traveling two time zones over. So let's give Wisconsin full benefit of the doubt here to prove what I'm saying, to prove what all of you obviously know, but for the sake of argument. Give Wisconsin five extra points because the home field advantage and the time change. Well, Oregon is still favored to beat them by about nine points, two scores per FPI. In SP Plus, this gap widens even more. And Oregon should win this game by about 16, 17 points, closer to three scores. And it's the same thing for the potential power index. So the Ducks have the superior team, and that is for a variety of reasons that we're going to be covering here in this video. So the pathway for Wisconsin to win is not for these teams to play both of their A-level games. Something has to give Wisconsin's way here. And you also see that in the point where Oregon is top 10 in points per play margin. On a play-by-play -play basis, they score 0 0.303 more points per one of their individual plays compared to one of their opponent's individual plays. That means on a play-by-play -play basis, Oregon just wrecks their opponents, and pretty casually so. In expected points added margin, which is really looking at where you are on the field, how successful are your drives, and how many points... Are you expected to earn each play? Oregon's pretty high there, too. They have a 0 0.243 expected points added margin. So on an average basis, they have a lot more success per play, and they're a lot more sustainable as an entire team than their opponents are on a play-by-play -play basis. For Wisconsin, they barely have a positive points per play margin. It's a 0 0.001. On an average basis, they sort of just well, tie with their opponents on a play-by-play -play basis. Now, they've played a very tough strength of schedule. Alabama, Penn State, on the road at Iowa, and Iowa at home. Iowa at home is one of the best teams in the country. Iowa on the road is a totally different story. But Iowa at home, with the offense that they have, when they play their A-level game, is one of the better teams. I'm going to retract best teams in the country, but they would challenge any team in the country if they played their A game and hosted anyone in Kinnick Stadium. It's just an opinion of mine with how their offense is played and how at times their defense is played. But they've had a very disappointing season. But then again, they beat the Badgers by 30-plus, and that game wasn't really close outside of the first quarter. And the EPA margin is not favorable to Wisconsin at all. Again, speaking of that strong schedule, Wisconsin has the 19th st toughest strength of schedule nationally, and they're 22nd in game control. So... Game control is the ranked probability of how the average top 25 team would do with your schedule. That's what it is. 
So per game control, Wisconsin is actually one of the 25 best teams in all of college football. Per my potential power index, they're inside the top 25. Per FPI, they are as well. S&P Plus, they're a bit lower, but they're, they're still viewed as an above average to good team. Not great. I don't think they have that ceiling, but Wisconsin has done a good job overall with what they have a backup quarterback a wide receiver room that has sustained several injuries a defense that they are still trying to retool and build and really a whole roster that they're still trying to build and they also have one of the best special teams units in all of football Oregon Dan Lanning did take over a better situation but he's also made the most of his situation too Oregon is one of the most talented teams in the country but they're not as talented as Ohio State or as Georgia or Alabama, per team talent composite. But it doesn't matter, because in my view, they look like the best team in football right now, especially when operating at their peak. They've played a top 50 strength of schedule, 49th, and even when you factor that in, they're fourth in game control. And a few weeks ago, they were seventh. A few weeks before that, they were outside the top 10. This is a team that on a week-per-week basis, on an average basis, maybe month-by-month is better to picture this, they're trending up. Wisconsin's trending up, too, But Oregon is clearly, I think, getting better and better and better on an average week-to-week basis, especially when you look at where they were earlier in the year. Keep in mind, a lot of power ratings are still factoring in those games against Idaho and Boise State that really, really weighed Oregon down. They started the year, remember, number two in FPI. I imagine if you factor out that Idaho game, And the Boise State game, they're probably number two in FPI right now, and they're probably higher in S&P Plus as well. I mean, honestly, because of the data my potential power index uses, they'd, they'd still be number one, but probably by a wider margin as well. So you have to factor in those games because they occurred. But my point is, this could be a team who is not even comparable to that team in week one or two because of some of the critical injuries they had and how they rested key players. Just wanted to shoot that out there because it's basically me telling you, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, that the predictive markets have not, they may have not caught up yet to how good Oregon is. And if that suspicion of mine is correct, there's a lot of value on picking them to win the national title and the Big Ten Championship, where I think Ohio State's still the favorite in those regards, if not very close to Oregon. And Ohio State's a very good team, but we're talking about Oregon here. And to get back on topic, the critical matchup in this game is Oregon's rushing attack, which does include quarterback Dylan Gabriel, is mobile enough to make defenses pay, against a Wisconsin defense that I think is well coached, that I think has a good, great pass defense. But in stopping the run, they have had some issues. Now, they've had some good games in run defense, but they've also had some very porous games. Alabama gashed them on the ground. Even more so did Iowa. They did a pretty good job against Penn State, though. But I think you can see the theme that against Alabama, they faced a mobile quarterback, a quarterback who may, may be better with his legs when at peak capacity than with his arm. And that's not a disrespectful comment to his arm because he's improved there. He's just that good of a scrambler in Jalen Milrow. Brennan Sullivan is another quarterback who might be similar in the regard to having better legs than arms when functioning at peak capacity. I don't know exactly if that's the case, and Brennan Sullivan is not even close to who Jalen Milrow is, but he's a mobile QB, and he really opens up that rushing attack, really does, and he made Wisconsin pay. Penn State with Drew Aller, they don't have much mobility there. They don't, and Aller is a quarterback who I don't think necessarily wants to run unless he has to when it comes to design or scrambling out of the pocket. When they used Bo Prabula, though, Penn State gave Wisconsin's defense a lot more fits. So that quarterback mobility is something that I'm curious to see how Mike Tressel attacks that, how Luke Fickle, how the staff attacks all of that, because... That could be the key for Oregon to quickly open up this game, to quickly build a big lead and shut out the crowd, which will be important here. I think if Wisconsin is able to hang around, if they're able to survive and do what they did against Penn State, hang around for a half, that this could be a very competitive affair in which the crowd may it, it may benefit Wisconsin. I say may 
because, yes, Oregon plays in a stadium that's one of the loudest in the country in Autzen. The toughest road game they faced all year in terms of environment was probably Michigan, and that's Michigan. There's not a lot of enthusiasm, understandably so, with that fan base. And that stadium is not known to be very loud outside of when they play Ohio State. Then it's weirdly one of the loudest places in the country. But the Ducks, they have mobility at quarterback. They have a really awesome offensive line, a rushing threat that features Noah Whittington, Lamar, more importantly, Jordan James. They have receivers that are going to test this Wisconsin secondary. Wisconsin's defensive line is really, really weak relative to Big Ten defensive lines. So the entire defense, especially the D-line, but the entire defense is going to have to step up and play one of its better games of the year if they want a chance at this upset. Either that or Wisconsin is going to have to put an incredible game plan together on offense. And more likely, both will have to happen at the same time if Wisconsin wants to pull this game off. Oregon, you look at their offense, they are 11th in yards per game with 453.8. They are 8th in yards per play, averaging 6.8. You look at scoring offense, they are 13th, averaging 37 points per game. They, on an average basis, score 0.554 points per play, which is 11th. They're 8th in points per play margin, which we already talked about. They're 12th in offensive touchdowns per game, averaging 4.4. You look at third down conversion percentage, they convert a whopping 51.38%, which is second. That's insane. It's because Will Stein is a damn good offensive coordinator. Dylan Gabriel is a veteran. They have weapons everywhere, and they're not afraid to be very weird or creative when it comes to converting their third downs, whether running on third and medium, whether just passing and using unorthodox formations or being very basic with checkdowns. They're willing to do anything to move the football. Their rushing offense in particular, which we are talking about, is averaging 5.1 yards per carry right now, which is 27th. It's slowly increasing as the weeks go by. They don't run the ball all that much, though. They only average 34.8 rushing attempts per game, which is 84th, and 176.3 rushing yards per game, which is 44th. But they are very efficient relative to the carries that they get. And they played Ohio State, who has a a good, near elite, elite at the best run defense. They have also played Michigan on the road, and Michigan has one of the best, if not the nation's best D line, despite the fact that their defensive coordinator and parts of their defense and team as a whole are inept. And I could go on and on and on, but Oregon has played teams that have physicality, especially when it comes to the defensive line. They played some of the best defensive lines in the country. And I mean, even Boise State. Boise State has some pretty good players on defense and especially on offense with Ashton GT. When you look at the fact that Oregon's rushing defense, I think is a bit underrated statistically due to the fact they've you know faced Henderson, they faced Judkins, they have faced Kalel Mullings, they have faced Ashton Genty again, and many other players. I mean, Roman Hemby, I could go on and on with the good running backs that they have played this year. They faced Oregon State, who just pounds the rock and hopes that that's enough to win. They faced a lot of good, or at least dedicated to running the football type offenses. So... I think there's still a negative bias toward that Oregon rush defense, which is just honestly, it's incredible. It's incredible to watch against Ohio State. It was incredible to watch against Michigan, and I could go on and on and on. As for Wisconsin, as to what I said earlier, the Badgers are not good in stopping the run. They're they're not good whatsoever. They allow opponents to average 4.8 yards per carry, which is 96th. Opponents average 169.8 yards per game on the ground against the Badgers, which is 88th. And opponents love to run the football on Wisconsin. Wisconsin's top 10 in opponent pass attempts per game. They only allow 25.9 pass attempts per game, which is 9th. Uh, their sack percentage isn't that good. That's because opponents don't really pass on Wisconsin all that much. Instead, they prefer to run on Wisconsin. Why? Because when you're averaging nearly 5 yards per carry against someone that's the perfect way to control the game. At that point, putting the ball through the air, unless you're keeping the defense honest, is a coaching malpractice because on the ground, you can control the game, you dictate the pace, you're moving the ball up and down the field, and yeah, you're probably going to score touchdowns or at least score field goals against a Wisconsin offense that only averages 24.9 points per game 
and 0.36 points per play. Both of those are outside of the top 70. In this matchup, pay attention to Iapani Lalolu, Nishad Strother, and Marcus Harper II, the interior of Oregon's offensive line. Pay attention to them. We all know that Johnny Cornelius and Josh Connerly Jr. are one of the best, if not the best, offensive tackle duos in the country. Pay attention to them, of course, but also the interior of the line. Look at Patrick Herbert, Kenyon Sadiq, Terrence Ferguson, those tight ends. How well do they do at blocking? Jordan James, Noah Whittington, Jaden Lamar, obviously pay attention to them. And watch out for Dylan Gabriel. I guarantee you he pulls the ball a few times when he sees an opportunity. And pay attention to whether or not Wisconsin makes him pay for that decision. And on the Wisconsin side of things, on their defensive front, Ben Barton, Kurt Neal, Daryl Peterson, Jake Cheney, those players are going to have to step up. And also Jaheim Thomas, Leon Lowry Jr., Tackett Curtis, Christian Allegro, Sebastian Cheeks. I'm curious to see how this front, this 3-4, 2-4-5, 3-3-5, how this defense really handles Oregon. What kind of looks do they give? Do they take an aggressive approach or do they take a bend but don't break approach? And they're willing to let Oregon play into running the football, but then they bow up in the red zone. I'm curious to see what happens in this matchup. Let's get to the offenses, the defenses, other matchups like the trenches, special teams, also a bit on coaching, and then I'll I'll get into my prediction here. Looking at these offenses, I would take Oregon at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, center, tackle. I'd take Wisconsin slightly at guard, but if you want to say the entire offensive line for Oregon is superior to Wisconsin's entire offensive line, I'm not going to argue with you. And in fact, if you want to make an argument that Wisconsin has the entirely superior offensive line, I'm not necessarily going to argue with that either, because Wisconsin doesn't have the skill players Oregon does. This is this is something that I've been critical about with Ohio State. Ohio State's skill position talent is so far ahead of the rest of the Big Ten, outside of Oregon, and a little bit of USC, though I think they're better than USC, and USC does not know how to manage their skill position talent. They don't. C. Miller Moss versus Jaden Maiava. Anyway, what Ohio State has been able to do in many games this season, many games in 2023, is they've been able to mask their deficiencies on the offensive line with their skill position talent. You have Kyle McCord, your offensive tackles, your guards, your center, they're they're blocking each other instead of opposing D lines in the run game, and they're occasionally getting burned in, in pass protection. Well, what do you do? Well, if you're Kyle McCord, you just fling it up to Cade Stover and Marvin Harrison Jr., and they're so good that it, analytically it's the smart thing to do. Like you throw that 50 50 ball, you take that risk because your player is so good and it's such a matchup edge on your opponent that it's worth it. It's not to say that Ohio State last year had an awful O-line. It was awful for OSU standards, but I'd say average. By the end of the year, probably above average or even good nationally in FBS standards. This season's O-line is probably above average to good at the very worst. If Simmons were healthy, this would be a near elite O-line in totality. Right now, they're probably good, maybe great. And I'm only saying that to mention that Wisconsin, all they really have is running the football. Their quarterback isn't very good in Braden Locke. Their receivers are good, but again, you really need a good QB or a respectable QB to get your good receivers the ball. They don't have that. Their tight end room is weaker than it has been on an average basis under Paul Christ. Their O-line and Tawi Walker is really the only potential non-negotiable they have. Meanwhile, Oregon has their offensive line, their veteran QB, their diverse set of running backs and tight ends, and most importantly, their receiver room. Uh, Tez Johnson is injured. I do not expect him to play in this matchup. I expect him to just heal up, and we'll see where things are. He's not out for the year, but I'd expect him to potentially be rested in this game, likely rested in this game, and also against Washington, too. You really want him for the playoff or for the Big Ten championship game, but Even considering that, Oregon has a 
one of the better receiver rooms in the country, even without Tess Johnson. They are very deep there. Looking at the quarterbacks, Dylan Gabriel on the season, 2,848 passing yards, 22 touchdowns, 5 picks, completes 74.1% of his throws, averages 8.9 yards per pass attempt with a 168.4 passer rating. His QBR is third, 86.7. He was also third in QBR last year, and he has 148 rushing yards and 6 rushing touchdowns. Jordan James leads the team in rushing yards with 946, 10 rushing touchdowns, averages 5.7 yards per carry. Noel Whittington is 383 with 4.5 yards per carry and 4 rushing touchdowns. Tez Johnson leads the team in receiving yards with 649, 8 receiving touchdowns. Evan Stewart is second, will probably be the leading receiver in this game with 517 receiving yards and 5 receiving touchdowns. Treshawn Holden has 592 receiving yards and 3 receiving touchdowns. Terrence Ferguson is a receiving touchdown and 390 receiving yards. Kenyon Sadiq is 233 receiving yards. Justice Lowe and Jordan James are other players with over 100 receiving yards. And Gabriel has only been sacked 10 times this season. You look at sack rate by these two offensive lines, they're some of the best in the nation at protecting their quarterbacks. Wisconsin actually has an edge here. They only allow 2.75% of their dropbacks to end in a sack. Oregon only allows 3.13% of their dropbacks to end in a sack, and both are also top 15 in quarterback sacked per game. Sack percentage is better because it factors in how much your offense passes the football. Michigan, for example, last year and in 2022 was very, very high in sacks allowed per game, but they were a little bit lower in sack percentage because they didn't pass the football as much as your average college football team did. Just for context as to why I think quarterback sack percentage is the superior metric to use. Oregon averages 8.9 yards per pass attempt, which is 11th, 12.4 yards per completion, which is 53rd. Again, high completion percentage, not a ton of explosive plays. That's how you get that lower yards per completion. Wisconsin's only 6.6 in yards per pass attempt, which is 103rd, 103rd, and they only average 11.3 yards per completion, which is 90th. On the ground, we already discussed these rushing offenses. Wisconsin averages 4.7 yards per carry. Oregon averages 5.1. And speaking of the Badgers... Their leading quarterback's Braden Locke with 1,418 passing yards, eight touchdowns, also eight interceptions. Yikes, one, one to one TDI and T ratio, 119.7 passer rating. He only completes 56.8% of his throws, and he, his QBR is 86th. Yeah, 86th. Their leading rusher, though, Tawi Walker, is one of the more underrated running backs in the Big Ten. He's powerful, puts his head down. Loves to break tackles and fall forward for extra yards. 676 rushing yards per, not per game, but overall. Averaging 5.8 or 4.8 yards per carry. He also has 10 rushing touchdowns. Kate Iacomelli has two rushing touchdowns and also 274 rushing yards. And Darian Dupree, who stepped up, he has one rushing touchdown, 206 rushing yards. On the receiving end of things, Darian Dupree, Bryson Green, Tretch Kahuna, C.J. Williams, Will Pauling, and Vinny Anthony II, they all each have 100 receiving yards at the bare minimum, with Kahuna, Williams, Pauling, and Anthony each having 200 receiving yards or more, and each having two receiving touchdowns. Vinny Anthony II leads the team in receiving yards with 443. Will Pauling leads the team in receptions with 40, and he has 398 receiving yards. I would take, overall, when it comes to the offensive line, Josh Connerly Jr., Nishad Strother, Iapani Lalolu, Marcus Harper II, and then Johnny Cornelius over Wisconsin's Jack Nelson, Joe Brunner, Jake Renfro, Joe Huber, and Riley Malmon, but it's very, very close, which I can't say for quarterback, easy Oregon, tight end, easy Oregon, wide receiver, easily Oregon, and same thing for running back, easily Oregon. If this was last year's Wisconsin running back room, might be a different story because Braylon Allen was that good and Malusi before he got hurt last year was also having a very productive season but things are different year to year and that's even more so the case with the portal where Wisconsin got Tawi Walker and without him I can't say that their rushing offense would even be that good looking at these defenses here I think the Ducks are better in every single category better on the D-line better at linebacker better at DB Let's check out some of the numbers here. When you look at scoring defense, excuse me there, Oregon only allows opponents to score 0.251 points per play. It's 12th. 
Wisconsin allows their opponents to score 0.359 points per play. 61st. Now, what Wisconsin's very good at is preventing their opponents from scoring in the red zone. Wisconsin's opponents only average 2.9 red zone scoring attempts per game, 26th. And Oregon, meanwhile, averages opponents to average 3.1 red zone scoring attempts per game, 46th. When you look at touchdowns, though, Oregon is one of the better teams in the nation in bend but don't break defense, really. They only allow 1.8 offensive touchdowns per game. And if you were to look at those touchdowns and narrow them down solely to the red zone, I imagine it would be even less than that, maybe around 1.5 or, or fewer per game. Wisconsin, they allow 2.8 offensive touchdowns per game, which is 51st. In total defense, Wisconsin allows the points to average 5.3 yards per play, 56th. Oregon allows the points to average 4.7, 15th. We already went over rushing defense, but just for a brief review, Wisconsin allows opponents to average 4.8 yards per carry. Oregon only allows opponents to average 4 yards per carry. Both have played very impressive rushing offenses, so there's not really more adjusting that you can do with those rushing defenses relative to each other. When it comes to defending the pass, Oregon has a 6.35 sack percentage, 57th. Wisconsin only has a 5.09 sack percentage, 94th. Wisconsin allows opponents to average 6.4 yards per pass attempt, 33rd, and 10.7 yards per completion, 24th. Oregon, meanwhile, allows opponents to average 5.7 yards per pass attempt, 7th, and 10.1 yards per completion, 11th. And you look at the, the total sacks for these teams. Wisconsin is 14 on the year. They have 29 passes defended, 3 interceptions, 3 forced fumbles, and 7 fumble recoveries. Oregon is 25 sacks on the year, 48 passes defended, 9 interceptions, 7 forced fumbles, and 5 fumble recoveries. I think Oregon does have the better defense here. And while I would take Mike Tressel over Tosh Lupoy, I would. I would take Oregon's defensive assistant coaches over what Wisconsin has. I don't know why. I don't know why Alex Grinch was hired to be the, the safeties coach at Wisconsin. That is a move that puzzles me. And the defensive line right now is not playing to a Big Ten standard. And I would say two years in, a part of that does have to be on coaching. Look out for Jordan Birch, Mateo Uyunglele, Derek Harmon, and Tietam Tioti in this matchup. These are players on Oregon's front. They each have three sacks or more. Birch leads the team with six. He also has a forced fumble and five passes defended. Derek Harmon has three sacks, two passes defended, and two forced fumbles with the fumble recovery as well. The Oregon Ducks right now, they have a very underrated defense, and Jabbar Muhammad leads the team in passes defended with nine. You have Dante Manning, Nico Reed, Brandon Johnson. You have Bryce Betcher and also Jeffrey Bossa leading that linebacker room. It's just overall a solid defense, and also, again, Look out for Mateo Yungalale, also Jamari Caldwell, who's the second starting D-tackle, along with Derek Harmon. For Wisconsin, their leader in sacks on the season is Christian Allegro with three. One pass defended as well. Elijah Hills and Sebastian Cheeks each have two sacks. They have a pass defended. Hills has the one pass defended. And Ricardo Holman and Hunter Wohler. If not had the seasons they did last year, but they're still very good DBs. And Preston Zachman, Nizir Forkwein, or Forkareen, Austin Brown, those players. I think this is one of the still one of the Big Ten's more talented secondaries. And their linebacker room: Jake Cheney, Jaheim Thomas, Leon Lowry Jr., Christian Aligro, Tack Curtis, Sebastian Cheeks. They have depth at the linebacker position. So pay attention to these two defenses here. In the trenches, I think it's clearly Oregon, as we've discussed. Better O-line, better D-line. Special teams, I would go with Wisconsin. I think they have a pretty good kicker and also a pretty good punter. Oregon has had some kicking issues. They are 12 of 15 on field goals on the year, 39 of 41 in extra points, and they're 1 of 3 from field goals of 50-plus, and most of their field goals are attempted, well, inside the 30. Wisconsin, 19 of 13 on field goal attempts. The majority of their field goals are beyond 30 yards. They are 3 of 3 from 50 plus, 0 of 2 from the 40s, and 3 of 5 from the 30s. Nathaniel Vacos 
is one of the better kickers in the Big Ten. They have a good punt unit, a good return unit. They're top 10 nationally in special teams efficiency per ESPN's football power index. Oregon has a lot of talent on special teams, but really outside of that Boise State game, we have not seen the special teams come through in a massive and impactful way. Well, the Ohio State game, too, with that onside kick. But, yeah, I mean, part part of that I almost wonder if that's, well, yeah, a lot of that's on the special teams, but it, it's still something that you look at, and it's it's just like, it's better to be good at the basics with special teams. Like, it, w- it would be better in that game if Atticus Sappington hadn't missed the field goal, for example, than for, um, am, am I wrong for saying that? It feels like, it feels like in general, it's better for your kicker to be very reliable than for your kickoff specialist to attempt one, uh, granted, extremely important onside kick, but still you wonder if part of me is like thinking in my mind right now, if you'd rather attribute that to the head coach and the decision there and the fact that he obviously forced the team to practice it or whether you attribute that to special teams. Probably a bit of both, and I don't want to go on a tangent because we have already talked a lot about this game and a lot about the Ducks, but Wisconsin is one of the best special teams units in the country. Oregon's close, not quite there, and and they mess up too much on the little things for me to say that they're better than Wisconsin. That's what I'm trying to say is that they they have big impact guys and decisions on special teams, but th- they mess up on the little things like extra points or missing some field goals that are not from that long of a distance. So I, hopefully you get the point. And as for coaching, I would take Dan Lanning over Luke Fickle right now. I'd take Will Stein over Phil Longo. Same with Will Stein's assistants. I would take Tosh Lupoy's assistants and that entire defensive staff over what Wisconsin has, and I think Oregon is one of the best strength and conditioning programs in the entire country. This leads me to pick Oregon, who's a 14.5-point favorite on the road at Wisconsin, to win. I think they cover, and I think they win by a score of about 35-10. to 10. Oregon is a team that doesn't really run up the score all that much, so I'm not going to predict them to score 40 points here. I think 35-10, to 10, good prediction, There were some things against Maryland. It was the same thing against Michigan, which I think tells you that this team's a bit bored and also that they're not perfect. This is not a team, just like every team in college football this year, this is not a GOAT caliber team. There are weaknesses that they have that I think Wisconsin in certain drives and plays will exploit. That's why I think they'll score some points. That's also why I don't think Oregon wins this game by 40. They could, but I don't think they will. So I think Oregon covers the spread. I think they win 35 to 10. The potential power pick here, this is my model, which uses a lot of different analytics. And yeah, that's really it. A lot of different analytics, statistics, and also a little bit of my personal opinion. Uh, Factoring in home field advantage, factoring in other things like, yes, it factors in the time change and how these two teams are in the power ratings. Oregon's picked to win this game by 16.6 points, which obviously that's not how football works. It'll be like, you know, 17 points or maybe 14 or 16 or 15. Uh, You know, the game with sevens and threes is the primary scoring metric, but it's picking Oregon to cover here. So you have that. I think Oregon wins. I think they cover this game. Thank you all so much for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, comment your thoughts down below, and sign up to support the channel via the Patreon page or purchasing merchandise through my merchandise store via the link in the description or down below in the pinned comment. Thanks to Crash2488, Brasco Rascal, and Connell OH for being Heisman members. Thanks to Chris Lane, Ismar, and Tyler Nye for being All-American members. And thanks to John Lynn, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Austin Christmas, Joshua Dragonson, and Will Loftus for being All-Conference members. Again, please check out my merchandise store, Patreon page, and Discord server via the link in the description or down below in the pinned comment. Have a great day, everyone. Go Badgers and go Ducks.